Hello, I'm Barbara Figgy Fox, and I'm here to tell you the next in the series of Every Button Has a Story. This 15 minute session will tell about collecting metal buttons. What kinds are there? How were they made? And what kinds of buttons can I expect to find that are beautiful? Here we go. I'm going to share my screen so that you can see some really beautiful buttons. Every button has a story. And I'm here to tell you this story and hope that I could interest you in joining the New Jersey State Button Society and collecting buttons. Metal is one of the four dozen materials from which buttons can be made. This is an example of a beautiful metal button that was stamped out. You'll recognize it as Raphael's Madonna. We're going to focus on buttons like this that were made in Birmingham, England in the 19th century. Each is a little work of art and they are not expensive. Large picture buttons like this could cost 15 or $20. And the little metal buttons can be as low as one or $2. Even though they're inexpensive, each is an example of fine work fine workmanship made a century ago, more than a century ago. More modern metal buttons might have realistic shapes. It could be made of yellow or white metal and they could be painted. Silver is being made by the Navajos into these buttons today. And it's fun to think about collecting uniform buttons or work clothes buttons. This rooster says, can't bust them. It was for a pair of overalls. And this is a uniform button for the Republican Club. You, could, you can find metal buttons made of pewter. This batter C pewter of a racing car is a modern button made in the 20th century. And just 20 years ago, these metal buttons were being sold in Somerset County, New Jersey. The story I'm going to tell today is about the metal buttons made in Birmingham, England. It was known as the city of a thousand trades. In the 16th century, it had a lot of ironsmiths and they made guns and knives and toys, tools and coins. Now Birmingham had the distinct advantage of there were no restrictive guilds, the no, no trade union laws. And so nonconformists were attracted to this region, Protestants and Quakers and scientists. It was described as no absurd forms of wearisome servitude are necessary to give the active tradesman the right to practice his art here. The atmosphere of this place is free to anyone. And the consequence has been that it reaped the benefit of active talent flowing in from all quarters. Indeed, Birmingham's laws or the absence of them, encouraged innovation. The city attracted free thinkers of all stripes, like James Watt and Erasmus Darwin. You can tell that Birmingham was a city of innovation because residents submitted three times as many patents in the 19th century as those of any other city in England. You could even call it the Silicon Valley of England, even into the 20th century. The free thinkers settled there, Conan Doyle, Tolkien, W.H. Auden. Now, because of the way 
uh, the industry was set up, the skilled workers often worked in small shops with their living quarters on the first floor and the workroom on the second floor. But soon the big manufacturers, like the owner of this mill, found a way to divide up the jobs using hand operated machines so that even the children could help. One button could be divided into, the work of one button could be divided into 50 to 70 different operations. Here's how that worked to transform sheets of metal, copper, white metal, gold metal, into coins and then into buttons. First, you had to have an artist to take a design and engrave it onto a steel die. You would take a painting or a sketch and, and carve it into iron and test to see what it looked like with clay, and then surround it with, um, with, with an iron band and put it in a kiln. To, to, to harden it. And they would cut sheets of tin, aluminum, brass, or copper into circles. And here, a guillotine-like weighted machine stamps that pattern into the metal circle to make a coin or a button or a buckle. If it looks like what, if it looks like the French head chopping device, the guillotine, that's because this machine came before the guillotine and the guillotine was fashioned after it. When Charles Dickens visited these button factories in 1852, he thought that it was just marvelous. Loud falls the stamp, the whirling lathes resound and engines heave while hammers clatter round. What labor forges, patient art refines till bright as dazzling day, metallic beauty shines. Now, patient art refining means that somebody has to trim and polish and, and sand the rough edges of the circles that were stamped out. Often this fell to the sons of, this, of, the, of the dads, the children worked in the factory. And again here, Children worked on, on with mothers. The women's job was to solder the shanks. She made a shank by taking a wire and cutting it and flattening the points. And then another woman, if she was in a factory, would add the solder and bake it on an iron plate. Now that factory owner we saw, Matthew Bolton, figured out how to divide the labor partly by using handheld machines so that it wasn't hard for one person to do their one task. And that's where child labor came in. Now, Charles Dickens, when he visited these factories, he thought it was perfectly fine for the children to be working with their parents because after all, they were safe and working with their parents and it was only a 10 or 11 hour day and they did have Sundays off. Now, um, you and I might think that this is pretty awful. But think about Charles Dickens's background. He, when he was a child, worked in a boot black um, chemical making factory. So I guess the, the button makers quarters smelled a lot better than the boot black factory. And that was the way it was, of course, in the 19th century. So the result with now that buttons could be mass produced in the 19th century, the result was that middle-class women could now afford them. They could buy a dozen buttons and use them on one dress and then take them off and use them on another dress, partly as decoration. Before then, it was the, it was the um, men who were dressed in beautiful uh, silks and velvets that, that um, wore the beautiful buttons and now but buttons are being mass produced in Birmingham. So uh, here's a picture of a woman wearing these buttons right down her dress. Um, 
on the right is a picture of a woman who grew up, who, who had a house in Trenton. It was the Couser Farm Mansion, Teresa Couser. And she's wearing those metal buttons. Looks like she has more than a dozen of them. Some women would have the same size button with a different pattern on it. So for instance, she might be a fan of history and have different patterns of history like this William Tell button. Or perhaps she would have a, um, um, a little for um, as, as a realistic mother would show a baby misbehaving. This, this button is called creeping baby, destroying a meal that's set for the table. But you see how each of these buttons, like the Raphael Madonna, was stamped out using that guillotine-like machine. Um, William Tell is perfectly plain and it has a plain, it's attached to a plain back, but Creeping Baby has a border. And, and you can see the size of it, about one and a half inches tall. Other examples of metal stamped buttons, including the back of this one, it's a Cupid's were our favorite subject. And the back of this one has a kind of a heart design. Two more different examples of metal buttons. And here's one that is pierced where we don't even see the back. It was um, just cut away. These gorgeous buttons are pierced, but they also boast what we call in the button world, steels, those little bits of faceted steel. These, most of these buttons are pierced. You can see through them, although this one isn't. Here's the whole tray. So you can see the array of them and the size. There's a penny that shows the size. In this, um, this is a Kate Greenaway design called Johnny and Vine. And you can see how we describe a metal button from the big book of buttons, which is like the Bible for us. And it's described as a one piece brass button, slightly concave with faceted steels and engraved details. So you can hardly see the engraving in this picture, but you can see the back showing that it's one piece and that um, shank that, that likely a woman carefully soldered on. There's another gorgeous button with faceted steels of mercury engraved. And we would probably call this an escutcheon. Escutcheon is um, the term we use for when, when a uh, solid piece of design something is put on top of uh, in this, in this picture, this would be an escutcheon. That's so this, the dog's head was applied and screwed on. This is an escutcheon where he, it's, it wasn't stamped out. It was two pieces, this, this uh, round circle. And then the escutcheon of the dog's head was stamped on. Let's not miss looking at these other gorgeous buttons. Here's Mercury. Here's Puss in Boots. Again, this is pierced and yellow metal and faceted steels, but in a different pattern from usual. And a chariot driver alternating faceted steels with the stamped out pattern. And here's that gorgeous card of dog buttons. So some of these pictures I've shown you came from other collections, but this is a card that I inherited from my grandmother who collected these in the 1940s and 50s. And since then, some um, canny uh, craftsmen have tried to make um, uh, counterfeit buttons like this. But I know that these aren't counterfeit because they didn't counterfeit any in the 40s and 50s. 
Um, here is an escutcheon, a stamped brass figure, and you can see the back of it. That's how you can tell an old button usually by, by how the shank, what the shank looks. That's a really old shank. And this is an interesting example of a source. Now, when I saw this button, I thought it was the Pied Piper, and I was all prepared to tell the story about the Pied Piper of Hamlin um, not being paid and and um, uh, ushering, seducing the children to follow him until they were swallowed up by the mountain. But then I discovered somebody had done the research and decided that it came from a painting. This painting by Louis Robert, The Arrival of Harvesters at the Pontine Marshes. This is quite something. And here you see this figure, which they took out of the um, painting. And he is um, playing the bag. Actually, he's playing the accordion here, but they gave him a bagpipe. Well, maybe that's a bagpipe. Who knows? But that's the excitement of looking up your button and saying, trying to find its history. It's really fun. Some of these button makers had a sense of irony and humor. This button is called pulling hair. And in this version, the doll is on the floor. But in this version, the kid is still holding the doll. One is more valuable than the other. I forget which one. I get to look it up and that's fun too. So collecting buttons is fun. And I hope that I can help, help you to explore the word of, world of button stories. I'm here to, um, to help you, buttonsinnewjersey at gmail.com. Some of you know my phone number, but you can find how to reach us by simply emailing buttonsinnewjersey at gmail.com or going to the website, newjerseystatebuttonsociety.com or our Facebook page. We're here to help you and we're here to entice you into the world of buttons.